now on to Arena presents Richard Kapuscinski's account of the last days of the rule of Haile Selassie in Jonathan Miller's much acclaimed production of The Emperor. I remember. Wasn't it just yesterday? Yesterday, but a century ago. In this city, but on a planet that is now far away. How all these things get confused. Times, places, the whole world broken in pieces, not to be glued back together again. Only the memory. That's the only remnant of life. It was a small dog, a Japanese breed. His name was Lulu. He was allowed to sleep in the Emperor's great bed. During various ceremonies, he would run away from the Emperor's lap and pee on dignitaries' shoes. The august gentlemen were not allowed to flinch or make the slightest gesture when they felt their feet getting wet. I had to move among the dignitaries and wipe the urine from their shoes with a satin cloth. This was my job for ten years. The emperor slept in a roomy bed made of light walnut. He was so slight and frail you couldn't see him. He was lost among the sheets. <laughs> in old age he became even smaller. He weighed 50 kilograms. He ate less and less, and never drank any alcohol. His knee stiffened up, and when he was alone, he dragged his feet swaying from side to side, as if on stilts. But when he knew that someone was watching him, he forced a certain elasticity into his muscles with great effort, so that he moved with dignity, and his imperial silhouette remained ramrod straight. Each step was a struggle between shuffling and dignity, between leaning and the vertical line. His majesty never forgot about this infirmity of his old age, which he did not want to reveal, lest it weaken the prestige and solemnity of the king of kings. Yes, but we servants of the royal bedchamber who saw his unguarded moments knew how much the effort cost him. You see, he had the habit of sleeping little and rising early when it was still dark outside. He treated sleep as a dire necessity that purposelessly robbed him of time he would rather have spent ruling or at imperial functions. Sleep? Sleep was a private, intimate interval in a life meant to be passed amid decorations and lights. Let me add, however, uh, that the Emperor never showed the slightest sign of irritation, or nervousness, anger, frustration or rage. It seemed that he never knew such states, uh, that his nerves were cold and dead like steel, or that he had no nerves at all. It was an inborn characteristic that His Highness knew how to develop and perfect, following the principle that in politics, nervousness signifies a weakness that encourages opponents and emboldens subordinates to make secret jokes. His Highness knew that a joke is a dangerous form of opposition, and he kept his psyche in perfect order. He got up at four or five, and when going abroad on a visit at three in the morning, upon waking, he would press the buzzer on his nightstand. The vigilant servants were waiting for the sound. The lights in the palace were turned on. It was a signal to the empire that his supreme majesty had begun a new day. The emperor began his day by listening to informers' reports. The night breeds dangerous conspiracies, and he knew that what happens at night is more important than what happens during the day. The custom of relating things by word of mouth had this advantage. If need be, the Emperor could say that a given dignitary had told him something quite different from what had actually been said, and the latter could not defend himself having no written proof. Thus, the Emperor heard from his subordinates not what they told him, but what he thought should be said. 
His venerable highness had his ideas and would adjust to them all the signals that came from his surroundings. It was the same with writing, for our monarch not only never used his ability to read, but never wrote anything and never signed anything in his own hand. Though he ruled for half a century, not even those closest to him know what his signature looked like. During the emperor's hours of official function, the minister of the pen always stood at hand and took down all the emperor's orders and instructions. His majesty spoke very softly, barely moving his lips. The minister of the pen, standing half a step from the throne, had to bend his ear close to the imperial lips in order to hear and write down the imperial decisions. Furthermore, the emperor's words were usually unclear and ambiguous, especially when he did not want to take a definite stand on a matter that required his opinion. One had to admire the emperor's dexterity. When asked by a dignitary for the imperial decision, he would not answer straight out, but would rather speak in a voice so quiet that it reached only the minister of the pen, who moved his ear as close as a microphone. The minister transcribed his ruler's scant and foggy mutterings. All the rest was interpretation, and that was a matter for the minister who passed down the decision in writing. The minister of the pen was the emperor's closest confidant and enjoyed enormous power. From the secret Kabbalah of the monarch's words, he could construct any decision that he wished. If a move by the emperor dazzled everyone with its accuracy and wisdom, it was one more proof that God's chosen one was infallible. On the other hand, if from some corner the breeze carried rumors of discontent to the monarch's ear, he could blame it all on the minister's stupidity. And so the minister was the most hated personality in the court. And public opinion, convinced of his venerable highness's wisdom and goodness, blamed the minister for any thoughtless or malicious decisions. Of which there were many. True. <laughs> uh, true. Mm -hmm. But in the palace, questions were always asked from top to bottom and never a vice versa. When the first question was asked in a direction opposite to the customary one, it was a signal that the revolution had begun. But we are getting ahead of ourselves, eh? Ah, uh, yes, my brother. And let's go back to the moment when the emperor appears on the palace steps in the morning and sets off for his early walk. He enters the park. This is the moment when Solomon Kedir, the head of the palace spies, approaches to give his report. The emperor walks along the avenue, and Kedir stays a step behind, talking all the while. Who met whom, where, and what they talked about. Against whom they are forming alliances. Whether or not one could call it a conspiracy. This department, part of Kadir's office, decodes the communications that pass among the divisions. It's good to know that no subversive thoughts are hatching there. His distinguished highness asks no questions, makes no comments. He walks and listens. Sometimes he stops before the lion's cage to throw them a leg of veal that his servant has handed to him. He watches the lion's rapacity and smiles. Then he approaches the leopards, which are chained and gives them ribs of beef. His Majesty has to be very careful as he approaches the unpredictable beast of prey. Finally, he moves on, with Kadir behind continuing his report. At a certain moment, the Emperor bows his head, which is a signal to Kadir to move away. He bows and disappears down the avenue, never turning his back on the Emperor. This is the moment when the waiting Minister of Industry and Commerce Makonen Habtewald emerges from behind a tree. He falls in a step behind the emperor and gives his report. Makonen Habtewald uh, keeps his own network of informers, both to satisfy his consuming passion for intrigue and to ingratiate himself with his venerable highness. On the basis of this information, he now briefs the emperor on what had happened last night. 
Again, his majesty walks on, listening without questions or comments, keeping his hands behind his back. He approaches a flock of flamingos, but the shy birds scatter as he comes near. The emperor smiles at the sight of these creatures which refuse to obey him. At last, still walking, he nods his head. Hapta Wahel, the four silent, retreats backwards, disappearing down the avenue. Next, as if springing up from the ground, rises the hunched silhouette of the devoted confidant, Asher Wald Mikhail. Now this dignitary supervises the government, political police. He competes with Solomon Kadir's intelligence service and battles fiercely against private informer networks like the one that McConan Habdewald has at his disposal. The occupation to which these people devoted themselves was hard and dangerous. They lived in fear of not reporting something in time and so falling into disgrace or of a competitor's reporting it better so that the emperor would think. Why did Solomon give me a feast today? And Makonnen bring only leftovers. Did he say nothing because he did not know? Or did he hold his tongue because he belongs to the conspiracy? <laughs> Hadn't I often experienced at cost to myself betrayal by my most trusted allies? The Emperor punished silence. On the other hand, Incoherent streams of words tired and irritated the imperial ear, so nervous loquaciousness was also a poor solution. Even the way these people looked told of the threat under which they lived. Tired, looking as if they hadn't slept, they acted under feverish stress, pursuing their victims in the stale air of hatred and fear that surrounded them all. They had no shield but the Emperor, and the Emperor could undo them with one wave of his hand, no, his benevolent highness did not make their lives easy. As I've mentioned, the emperor never commented on or questioned the reports he received on his morning walks about the state of conspiracy in the empire. But he knew what he was doing, as I shall show you. His highness wanted to receive the reports in a pure state, because if he asked questions or expressed opinions, the informant would obligingly adjust his report to meet the emperor's expectations. Then the whole system of informing would collapse into subjectivity and fall prey to anyone's willfulness. The monarch would not know what was going on in the country or the palace. Finishing his walk, the emperor listens to what is reported last night by Asher's people. And then he admires the anteater, which he recently received as a gift from the president of Uganda. He nods his head and Asher walks away, bent over, wondering whether he said more or less than what was reported by his most fervent enemies. Solomon, the enemy of Merkonen and Asher. Merkonen, the enemy of Asher and Solomon. And so the Emperor finishes his walk alone. It grows light in the park. The fog thins out and reflected sunlight glimmers on the lawn. The Emperor ponders. Now is the time to lay out strategies and tactics, to solve the puzzles of personality, to plan his next move on the chessboard of power. He thinks deeply about what was contained in the informant's reports. <laughs> A little of importance, they usually report on each other. His Majesty has made mental notes on everything. His mind is a computer which retains every detail. Even the smallest datum will be remembered. There was no personnel office in the palace. No dossiers full of personal information. All this was carried in the Emperor's mind. All the most important files on the elite. I can see him now as he walks, stops, walks again. Lifts his head upwards as though absorbed in prayer. Oh God! Save me from those who, crawling on their knees, hide a knife that they would like to sink into my back. But how can God help? All the people surrounding the Emperor are just like that, on their knees and with knives. No, it is never comfortable on the summits. 
As the keeper of the third door, I was the most important footman in the audience hall. The hall had three sets of doors and three footmen to open and close them. But I held the highest rank because the emperor passed through my door. When his most exalted majesty left the room, it was I who opened the door. It was an art to open the door at the right moment, at the exact instant. To open the door too early would have been reprehensible, as if I was hurrying the emperor out. If I opened it too late, on the other hand, his sublime highness would have to slow down or maybe even stop, which would detract from his lordly dignity. A dignity that meant getting around without obstacles or collisions. Our office was in the old palace where most of the imperial institutions were located since our emperor wanted to have everything within easy reach. Now, he was brought there in one of the 27 automobiles that made up his private fleet. He liked automobiles. He prized the Rolls Royces for their dignified lines, but for a change, he would also use the Mercedes Benzes and the Lincoln Continentals. Uh, didn't our emperor almost lose his power in his life when he brought the first aeroplane from Europe in the 1920s? The simple plane struck the people as an invention of Satan, and in the courts of magnets there sprang up conspiracies against the emperor as if he were a cabalist or necromancer. Mm. His oh. revered highness had to control ever more carefully his inclinations to act the pioneer until, in that stage of life, when novelty holds little interest for an aged man, he almost gave them up. And so, at nine o'clock, he would arrive at the old palace. Before the gate, a crowd of subjects waited to try and hand petitions to the emperor. Because our nation is illiterate, and justice is usually sought by the poor, people would go into debt for years to pay a clerk to write down the complaints and demands. There was also a problem of protocol. Since custom required that the humblest ones kneel before the emperor with their faces to the ground. How can anyone hand an envelope to a passing limousine from that posture? <laughs> but the problem was solved in the following manner. The vehicle would slow, the benevolent face of the monarch would appear behind the glass, and the security people from the next car would take some of the envelopes from the extended hands of the populace. Only some, for there was a whole thicket of these hands. If the mob crawled too close to the oncoming cars, the guards had to push them back, since the solemnity of majesty required that the procession be smooth and free of unexpected delays. Now the vehicles drove up the ascending avenue and stopped in the palace courtyard. Here too a crowd awaited the emperor, but a different one from the rabble that had been furiously driven away by select members of the imperial bodyguard. Those waiting in the courtyard to greet the emperor were from the monarch's own circles. We gathered early so as not to miss the emperor's arrival because that moment had a special significance for us. Everyone wanted very badly to be noted by the emperor. No, one didn't dream of any special notice with the revered emperor catching sight of you, coming up, starting a conversation. Oh no, nothing like that, I can assure you. One wanted only the smallest, second-rate sort uh, yes, of attention. Yes, yes, Nothing that would burden yes, the emperor with obligations. Oh, a passing notice, yes, a fraction of a second. Yes, but the sort of notice yes, that would later make one tremble inside and overwhelm one with the triumphal thought of, I have been noticed. Oh, what strength he gave afterwards. What unlimited possibilities he created. Let's say the imperial gaze just grazes your face. Oh. Just grazes. Just grazes. You could say that it was really nothing. But on the other hand, how could it really be nothing if it did graze you? Oh, Immediately you feel the temperature in your face rise, the blood rush to your head, and your heart beat harder. These are the best proofs that the eye of the protector has touched you. Yes. But so what? These proofs have no importance at the moment. More important is the process that might have taken place in His Majesty's memory. You see, it was known that His Majesty, not using his powers of reading and writing, had a phenomenally developed visual memory. On this gift of nature, the owner of the face of which the imperial gaze had passed could build his hopes, because he could already count on some passing traits, even an indistinct trace, having imprinted itself on His Majesty's memory. 
Now you had to maneuver in the crowd with such perseverance and determination. So squeeze yourself and worm through. So push, so jostle, so position your face. Dispose and manipulate it in such a way that the Emperor's glance unwillingly and unknowingly would notice, notice, notice. 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 And then you waited for the time to come when the Emperor would think, Just a minute. I know the face, but I don't know the name. <laughs> And let us say he would ask for the name. Only the name, but that is enough. Now the name and the face are joined and a person comes into being, a ready candidate for nomination, because the face alone, that's anonymous. The name alone, an abstraction. You have to materialize yourself, take on shape and form and gain distinctness. Oh, that was the good fortune most longed for. But how difficult it was to realize. Because in the courtyard where the emperor's retinue awaited him, there were tens, no, I say without exaggeration, hundreds eager to press their faces forwards. Face pressed against face, the tall ones squelching down the shorter ones. The darker ones overshadowing the lighter ones. The face despised face, face, face. The older ones pushing in front of the younger ones. The weaker ones making way for the stronger ones. The common ones clashing with the noble ones. The grasping ones against the weakling. Face crush face, but even the humiliated ones, the ones pushed away, the third rate and the defeated ones, even those from a certain distance imposed by the law of hierarchy, it's true, still move towards the front, showing here and there from behind the first rate, the titled ones, if only as a fragment, an ear, a piece, a temple, a cheek, a jaw, just to be closer to the emperor's eye. If his benevolent majesty wanted to capture with his glance the whole scene that opened before him when he stepped from his car, he would perceive that not only was a hundred faced magma at once humble and frenetic rolling towards him, but also that, aside from the central highly titled group, to the left and to the right, in front of him and behind, far and even farther away in the doors and the windows on the paths whole multitude of lackeys kitchen servants janitors gardeners and policemen were pushing their faces forward to be noticed and his majesty takes it all in does it surprise or amaze him i doubt it his majesty himself was once part of the hundred face magma didn't he have to push his face forward in order to become heir to the throne at the age of only 24? And there was a hell of a lot of competition. A whole squadron of experienced notables striving for the crown. But they were in a hurry, one cutting in front of the other at each other's throats, trembling, impatient, quickly, quickly to the throne. But his peerless majesty knew how to wait. And that is an all-important ability. Without that ability to wait, to realize humbly that the chance may come only after years of waiting. There is no politician. His distinguished majesty waited 10 years to become heir to the throne and then another 14 years to become emperor. In all, close on quarter of a century of cautious but energetic striving. I say cautious because it was characteristic of his majesty to be secretive, silent and discreet. He knew the palace. He knew that every wall had ears and that from behind every arras gazed eyes attentively scrutinizing him. So he had to be cunning and shrewd. First of all, one must not unmask oneself too early, showing the rapacity for power. That galvanizes competitors and makes them rise to combat. They will strike and destroy the one that moves the fall. No. One should walk in step for years taking care not to spring ahead, waiting attentively for the right moment to strike. In 1930, this game brought His Majesty the crown, which he kept for 44 years. I was His Most Virtuous Highness's pillow bearer for 26 years. His Majesty spent the hour between 9 and 10 in the morning handing out assignments in the audience hall. And thus this time was called the Hour of Assignment. His Majesty would enter the hall where a row of waiting dignitaries nominated for assignment bowed humbly. His Majesty would sit on the throne and when he had seated himself I would slide a pillow under his feet. 
this had to be done like lightning, so as not to leave our distinguished monarch's legs hanging in the air for even a moment. We all know his highness was of small stature. At the same time, the dignity of the imperial office required that he be elevated above his people, even in a strictly physical sense. Thus, the imperial thrones had long legs and high seats, especially those left by Emperor Menelik, an exceptionally tall man. Therefore, a contradiction arose between the necessity of a high throne and the figure of his most venerable majesty. A contradiction most sensitive and troublesome precisely in the region of the legs, since it is difficult to imagine that an appropriate dignity can be maintained by a person whose legs are dangling in the air like those of a small child. The pillow solved this delicate and all-important conundrum. His Majesty could not go anywhere without me, since his dignity required that he always take his place on a throne, and he could not sit on a throne without a pillow, and I was the pillow bearer. <laughs> I had mastered the special protocol of this speciality, and I even possessed an extremely useful expert knowledge. The height of various thrones. This allowed me to quickly choose a pillow of just the right size, so that a shocking ill fit allowing a gap to appear between the pillow and the emperor's shoes would not occur. In my storeroom, I had... 52 pillows of various sizes, thicknesses, materials, and colors. I personally monitored their storage constantly so that fleas, yes, fleas, the plague of our country would not breed there since the consequences of any such oversight could lead to a very unpleasant scandal. Working as a protocol official in the Hall of Audiences, I noticed that, in general, assignment caused very basic physical changes in a man. Now, this so fascinated me that I started to watch more closely. First, the whole figure of a man changes. What had been slender and trim-waisted now starts to become a square silhouette. It is a massive, solemn square, a symbol of the solemnity and weight of power. We can already see that this is not just anybody's silhouette, but that of visible dignity and responsibility. Now a slowing down of movements accompanies this change in the figure. A man who has been singled out by his distinguished majesty will not run, jump, frolic or cut a caper, no. His step is solemn. He sets his feet firmly on the ground, slightly bending his body forward to show his determination to push through adversity, ordering precisely the movements of his hands so as to avoid any nervous, disorganized gesticulation. Furthermore, the facial features become more solemn, almost stiffened, more worried and closed, but still capable of a momentary change to optimism or approval. All in all, however, they are set so as to create no possibility of psychological contact. One cannot relax, rest, or even catch one's breath next to such a face. Now the gaze changes too. Its length and angle are altered. The gaze is trained on a completely unattainable point. In accordance with the laws of optics, an appointee cannot perceive us when we speak to him, since his focal point is well beyond us. We cannot be perceived because he looks obliquely. And by a strange periscopic principle, even the shortest appointees can look over our heads towards an infinite distance or in the direction of some particular private thought. Now we realize that any attempt to convey our own thoughts would be senseless and petty, so therefore, we fall silent.
The degree of power wielded by those in the palace corresponded not to the hierarchy of position, but to the frequency of access to his imperial majesty. That was our situation in the palace. It was said that one was more important if one had his majesty's ear more often, more often and for longer. For that ear, the lobbies fought their fiercest battles. The ear was the highest prize in the game. It was enough, though it was not easy, to get close to the all-powerful ear and whisper. Whisper, that's all. Get it in. Let it stay there, if only as a floating impression, a tiny seed. The time will come when the impression solidifies, the seed will grow, then we will gather the harvest. These were subtle maneuvers, demanding tact, because His Majesty, despite amazingly indefatigable energy and perseverance, was a human being with an ear which one could not overload and stuff up without causing irritation and an angry reaction. That is why access was limited and the fight for a piece of the Emperor's ear never stopped. I will add that, in relation to his modest size and pleasing form, His Majesty had ears of a large configuration. And so, having finished the hour of assignments, His Majesty would move on to the Golden Hall. Here began the hour of the cash box. This hour came between 10 and 11 in the morning. His Highness was accompanied by the saintly Abahana, who in turn was assisted by his faithful bagbearer. Someone with good ears and a good nose could tell how the palace rustled with money, smelt of it. But this called for special sensitivity and imagination because money was not lying around the chambers and his most merciful highness showed no inclination to shower packets of dollars among his favorites. No, his highness cared little for that sort of thing. I was the purse bearer to Abahana Gemma, a God-fearing confessor and treasurer to the emperor. Abahana's unlimited access to the throne proved the intimacy of their relationship. You could even call it a continuous access. As keeper of the cash box and confessor to our much lamented monarch, Abba could look into the imperial soul and the imperial pocket. In other words, he could see the imperial person in its dignified entirety. As his purse bearer, I always accompanied Abba in his fiscal activities, carrying behind him the bag of top-grade lambskin that those who destroyed everything later exhibited in the streets. I also took care of another bag, a large one, that was filled with small coins on the eve of national holidays. The Emperor's birthday, the anniversary of his coronation, the anniversary of his return from exile. On such occasions, our august ruler would go into the most crowded and liveliest quarter of Addis Ababa, where, on a specially constructed platform, I would place the heavy jingling bag, from which His Benevolent Highness could scoop the handfuls of coppers that he threw into the crowd of beggars and other such greedy riffraff. The rapacious mob would create such a hubbub, however, that this charitable action always had to end in a shower of police batons on the heads of the frenzied, pushy rabble. Saddened, His Highness had to walk away from the platform. Often, he was unable to empty even half the bag. In the Golden Hall, there was always electricity in the air. One could feel the current flowing through the temples of those that had been summoned, making them quiver. Everyone knew the source of that current, a little bag of finest lambskin. People would approach His Majesty by turns, saying why they needed money. His Majesty would listen and ask questions. Here I must admit that His Majesty was most meticulous when it came to financial matters. Any expenditure anywhere in the empire of more than ten dollars required his personal approval. If a minister came to ask the approval of the spending of one dollar, he was praised. To repair a minister's car, the emperor's approval is needed. To replace a leaking pipe in the city, the emperor's approval is needed. 
to buy sheets for a hotel, the emperor must approve it. How you should admire, my friend, the diligent thrift of his august majesty, who spent much of his royal time checking accounts, listening to cost estimates, rejecting proposals, and brooding over human greed, cunning, and meddling. His lively curiosity, vigilance, and exemplary economy always attracted mention. You see, he had a fiscal bent, and his minister of finance was counted among those with the most access to the emperor. And yet, to those in need, his highness would stretch out a generous hand. Having listened as his questions were answered, his charitable majesty would inform the petitioner that his financial needs would be met. The delighted subject would make the deepest bow, and then his magnanimous highness would turn his head in the direction of Abahana and specify in a whisper the amount of money that the saintly nobleman was to take from the purse. Abahana would plunge his hand into the bag, take out the money, put it into an envelope, and hand it to the lucky recipient. Bow after bow, backwards, backward, shuffling his feet and stumbling, the fortunate one would leave. And afterward, one could unfortunately hear the cries of the wretched ingrate. Because in the envelope, he would find only a fraction of the sum that, as the insatiable thieves always swore, had been promised to him by our generous emperor. Have you any idea what money means in a poor country? Money in a poor country and money in a rich country are two different things. In a rich country, money is a piece of paper with which you buy goods on the market. You are only a customer. Even a millionaire is only a customer. Well, he may purchase more, but he remains a customer, nothing more. In a poor country, <laughs> in a poor country, money is a wonderful, thick, hedge, dazzling and always blooming, that separates you from everything else. Through that hedge, you do not see creeping poverty. You do not smell the stench of misery or hear the voices of the human dregs. But at the same time, you know that all that exists. But you feel proud because of your hedge. You have money, therefore you have wings. You are the bird of paradise that everyone admires. So everyone, if he proved his loyalty, could count on a bountiful gift, there were still continuous quarrels between lobbies, constant struggles for privileges, incessant grabbing, and all because of the needs of that bird of paradise that fills every man. His most extraordinary majesty liked to watch this elbowing. He liked the people of the courts to multiply their belongings. He liked their accounts to grow and their purses to swell. I don't remember his magnanimous highness ever demoting someone and pressing his head to the cobblestones because of corruption. One case, though, was different. An outstanding patriot and leader of the partisans in the war against Mussolini, Tekeli Waldi Harawat by name, was ill disposed towards the emperor. He refused special privileges and never showed any inclination toward corruption. His Majesty had him imprisoned for many years and then cut off his head. The hour of the ministers began at 11 o'clock and ended at noon. It was not trouble to call the ministers, since by custom these dignitaries stayed in the palace all morning. Various ambassadors often complained that they were unable to visit a given minister in his office to take care of problems because his secretary would invariably say that the minister has been summoned to the emperor. <laughs> in point of fact, the emperor liked to keep an eye on everyone. He liked to keep everyone within reach. A minister who stayed away from the palace appeared in a bad light and never lasted long. But the ministers, God knows, never tried to stay away. No one ever reached such a position without knowing the monarch's likings and trying assiduously to comply with them. Whoever wanted to climb the steps to the palace had first to master the negative knowledge. What was forbidden to him and his subalterns? What was not to be said or written? What should not be done? What should not be overlooked nor neglected? 
Only from such negative knowledge could positive knowledge be born. But even that positive knowledge remained obscure and worrisome. Because no matter how well they knew what not to do, the emperor's favorites ventured only with extreme caution and uncertainty into the area of propositions and postulates. There, they would immediately look to his distinguished majesty, waiting to hear what he would say. And since his majesty had the habit of being silent, waiting, and postponing things, they too were silent waited and postponed things. His benevolent highness would show favor to those ministers who were not distinguished by quick wits and perspicacity. He treated them as a stabilizing element in the life of the empire, while he himself, as everyone knows, was always champion of reform and progress. Ah, a reach, my dear friend, for the autobiography, dictated by the emperor in his last years, and you will be convinced of how his valiant highness fought against the barbarity and obscurantism that reigned in our country. Ah, here is the London edition of my life and Ethiopia's progress, translated by Ullendorf. Uh, here, for example, His Majesty mentions at the beginning of his reign that he forbade the customary punishment of cutting off hands and legs for even a minor offense. Uh, next, he writes that he forbade the custom of a man who had been accused of murder would have to be publicly executed by disembowelment, with this execution performed by the closest member of family, so that, for example, a son would disembowel his father, a mother disembowel her son. To replace that custom, His Majesty instituted the Office of State Executioner, designated specific sites and procedures for execution, and stipulated that execution be only by shooting. And then he purchased out of his own funds, a point which he emphasizes, the first two printing presses, and recommended that the first newspapers in the history of our country begin publication. And then he introduced banks, and then electricity, first in the palaces, and then in other buildings. And then he abolished a custom of shackling prisoners in chains and iron stocks. From then on, prisoners were watched over by guards paid for by the imperial treasury. And then he promulgated a decree condemning the slave trade. He decided to end that trade by 1950. 1950. And he kept on reforming. He abolished forced labor, he imported the first motor cars, he created a postal service. Ah, unfortunately, driven by his desire for progress, our august ruler committed a certain imprudence. Because there was no state schools or universities in our country, the emperor began sending young people abroad to study. These people would return home full of devious ideas disloyal views, damaging plans, and unreasonable and disorderly projects. They would take one look at the empire, put their heads in their hands and cry, good God, how can anything like this exist? Here we have, my friends, one more proof of the ingratitude of youth. On the one hand, so much care taken by His Majesty to give them access to knowledge. On the other hand, his reward in the form of shocking criticisms, abusive sulkings, undermining's, and rejection. It's easy to imagine the bitterness with which these slanderers filled our monarch. Anyway, at one o'clock, his distinguished highness left the old palace and proceeded to his residence for dinner. The emperor was accompanied by members of his family and those dignitaries invited for the occasion. The old palace quickly emptied. Silence filled the corridors, and the guards fell into their midday slumber. Nineteen sixty was a woeful year, my friend. A venomous maggot began to infest the robust and succulent root of our empire, and everything took such a morbid and irreparable cause that instead of juice, alas, the fruit oozed blood. Now, Germain was one of those disloyal people who, upon returning to the Empire, 
threw up their hands in exasperation. But they did this secretly. In public, they displayed loyalty, and in the palace, they said what was expected of them. And our august ruler, oh, how I reproach him for it today, let himself be taken in. When Germain stood before him, our most compassionate majesty looked upon him with a loving eye and made him governor of a region in the southern province of Sidamo, the good soil there yields rich coffee. Hearing of this appointment, people in the palace said that our omnipotent ruler was laying the path clear to the highest honors for this young man. So, Germain left the palace with the emperor's blessing, and for a while, things were quiet. After some time, though, dignitaries from Sidamo began to appear. They came and loitered around the palace, delicately dropping hints in conversational lulls, that Germain took bribes and used them to build schools. After all, it was understandable that a governor should accept tributes. All the dignitaries accepted tributes. The abnormality of it was this, that a governor should use these tributes to build schools. Now, what if a second Germain springs up in a second province and starts giving away his bribes? Immediately, you will have a mutiny of governors protesting at this principle of giving away bribes. The result? The end of the empire. Oh, no. Germain was summoned to the capital for the hour of assignments and sent down to be governor of Zhizhiga, where he couldn't give away the land because the only inhabitants were nomads. During the ceremony, Germain committed an offense that should have awakened the utmost vigilance in his august majesty. After hearing his appointment read, Germain failed to kiss the monarch's hand. That evil spirit. Together with his brother and a certain Captain Bai of the Imperial Guard, fled the city and remained in hiding for a week. They traveled only at night. For a price of $5,000 had immediately been put on their head and everyone was looking for them, since that is a great deal of money. Now they tried to make their way south, probably intending to cross into Kenya. But after a week, as they sat hidden in the bushes, having not eaten for several days and fainting from thirst, they were captured by the peasants who had been beating the bush to find them. Now when the peasants rushed forward to capture them, Gamain shot by, then he shot his brother, and finally he shot himself. His majesty was informed of all this, and when he heard it, he said he wanted to see Gamain's body. Accordingly, the corpse was brought to the palace and thrown on the steps in front of the main entrance. His Majesty came out and stood for a long time, just looking at the body that was lying there. He remained silent, gazing without saying a word. And then the Emperor turned, as if he had been startled, and walked back into the main building, ordering his lackeys to close the door. Later, I saw Germain's body hanging from a tree in front of St. George's Cathedral. And that is when his masterful highness started a purge in the palace. It was not an instantaneous and complete purge, because his majesty opposed impious and noisy violence, preferring an exchange in careful doses, thought out, which would keep the old residents in check and in constant fear, while at the same time opening the palace to new people. His most benevolent highness no longer hurled people into dungeons, but quite simply sent them home from the palace. Until that moment, you were a man of the palace, a prominent figure, a leader, someone important, influential, respected, talked about and listened to. All this gave one a feeling of existence, of presence in the world, of leading a full, important, useful life. And then His Highness summons you to the hour of assignments and sends you home forever. Everything disappears in a second. You stop existing. Nobody will mention you. Nobody will put you forward or show you any respect. You may say the same words you said yesterday. And though yesterday people listened to them devoutly, today 
they don't pay any attention. On the streets, people pass you with indifference. And already you can see that even the smallest provincial functionary can tell you to go to hell. His Highness has turned you into a weak, defenseless child and thrown you to a pack of jackals. Good luck. From the day Germain shot himself, a negative system began operating between people and things. People could no longer control things. Things existed and ceased to exist in their own malicious ways, slipping through people's hands. People felt helpless in the face of this seemingly magic force by which things autonomously appeared and disappeared. And nobody seemed able to master or break that force. This feeling of helplessness, of always losing, of always falling behind the stronger, drove people deeper into negativism, into numbness, into dejection, into depression, into hiding like partridges. Even conversation deteriorated, losing its vigor and momentum. Conversations would start, but never seemed to be completed. The palace was sinking. We all felt it. We veterans in the service of his venerable majesty, we whom fate had saved from the purge, we could feel the temperature falling, but life becoming more and more precisely framed by ritual, but more and more cut and dried, banal, negative. You see, our empire had existed for hundreds, even thousands of years without any noticeable development. However, the world began to change Everybody wanted to develop themselves. Our emperor, infinitely infallible, noticed and generously agreed with this, seeing the advantages and charms of costly novelty. And since he had always had a weakness for all progress, indeed, he liked progress. His most honorably benevolent desire for action manifested itself in the unconcealed desire to have a satiated and happy people cry for years after with full approval, hey, did he ever develop us? And so, in the hour of development between four and five in the afternoon, His Highness showed particular vivacity and keenness. He received processions of planners, economists, and financial specialists, talking, asking questions, encouraging and praising. One was building, another was planning, and so, in a word, development had started. And how? His indefatigable majesty would ride out to open a bridge here, a building there, an airport somewhere else, giving these structures his name. The Haile Selassie Bridge in the Ogaden. The Haile Selassie Hospital in Ara. The Haile Selassie Hall in the capital. And so whatever was created bore his name. He also laid cornerstones, supervised construction, cut ribbons, took part in the ceremonial starting of a tractor. Now, instead of showing their gratitude for the benefits of development, youngsters launch themselves on the turbid and treacherous waters of slander and faction. Alas, my friends, it is a sad truth that despite His Majesty having led the empire onto the path of development, the students reproach the palace for demagoguery and hypocrisy. How do they talk of development in the midst of such other poverty? Hmm? <laughs> what sort of development is it when the whole nation is being wrecked by misery? All provinces are starving. If you can afford a pair of shoes, only a handful of such can read or write. Anyone who falls seriously ill dies because there are neither hospitals nor physicians. Yes. Illiteracy and ignorance hold sway everywhere. Barbarity, humiliation, trampling underfoot, despotism, exploitation, and desperation! And on and on in this tone, reproaching, calumniating ever more arrogantly. They speak out against sweetening and dressing things up, taking advantage of his clement highness, who only rarely ordered for the mutinous rabble which spilled from the university gates in a larger mass each year, be fired upon. The time came when they brought out their impudent whim of reforming. Development, they said, is impossible without reform. Keep the peasants land! Abolish privileges! Democratize society! Lick 
Iniquity feudalism! And as a consequence of our benefactor's concern to develop the forces of order, and thanks to his great generosity in that area, the number of policemen multiplied in the last years of his reign, and ears appeared everywhere, sticking up out of the ground, glued to walls, flying through the air, hanging on doorknobs, lurking in crowds, standing in doorways. jostling in the marketplace. To protect themselves from this plague of informers, the people learned without anybody knowing how or where or when, without schools or courses, without records or dictionaries, another language, and mastered it and became so fluent that we simple, uneducated folk suddenly became a bilingual nation. And it was extremely helpful. It even saved lives, preserved the peace, and allowed people to exist. Each of the two different languages had a separate vocabulary, a different set of meanings, and even a different grammar. But people overcame these difficulties and learned to express themselves in the proper language. One tongue served for external speech, the other for internal. The first sweet, the second bitter. The first polished, the second coarse. One allowed to come to the surface the other kept out of sight. In the summer of 1973, a sudden Jonathan Dimbleby, a journalist from London Television, came to our country. Now, he had visited the Empire before and made commendable films about His Supreme Majesty. And so it occurred to no one that such a journalist who had earlier praised would dare to criticize the later. But such is obviously the dastardly nature of people without dignity or faith. Anyway, this time, instead of showing how his highness attends to development and cares for the prosperity of the little ones, Mr. Dimbleby went up north, from where he supposedly returned perturbed and shaken. Right away he left for England. A month hadn't passed when a report came from our embassy there that Mr. Dimbleby had shown a film entitled Ethiopia, the Unknown Famine on London TV, in which this unprincipled calumniator pulled the demagogic trick of showing thousands of people dying of hunger, and next to that, our venerable majesty feasting with dignitaries. Then he showed a roads on which poor famished skeletons were lying, and immediately afterwards, our airplanes bringing champagne and caviar from Europe. Here you can see the irresponsibility of the foreign press, which, like Mr. Gimbleby, praised our monarch for years, and then suddenly, without any rhyme or reason, condemned him. Why? Why such treason and immorality, ha? Ha, ha, ha! The embassy then reports that a whole plane load of European Dimbleys is taking off from London to come see death from hunger, to know our reality, and to determine where the money goes their government is giving to our august majesty for development, catching up, and surpassing. Bluntly speaking, interference in the internal affairs of the empire. And so, not surprisingly, members of the Crown Council speak up, demanding that the planes carrying the journalists be turned back, and that none of the blasphemous rabble be let into the empire. How can we not let them in? They will raise hell and condemn his gracious majesty more than ever. Let them in, but deny the hunger. Yes. Keep them in Addis Ababa. Mm -hmm. Show them the development. Oh, Let them write only what can be read in our newspaper. Oh. We have a loyal press, yes? yes? Yes. To tell the truth, there wasn't much of it. Because for over 30 million subjects, 25,000 copies were printed daily. But His Highness worked on the assumption that even the most loyal press should not be given in abundance because that might create the habit of reading. And from there, it is only a single step to the habit of thinking. Anyway, my friend, a press conference took place. Uh, what does the problem of death from hunger, which decimates the population, look like? I know nothing of any such matter. Answers the Minister of Information, and I have to tell you, my friend, he wasn't far from the truth. Uh, uh, first of all, a death from hunger has existed in our empire for hundreds of years. And 
everyday natural thing and it never occurs to anyone to make a noise about it. A drought comes, the earth dries up, the cattle die, the peasants starve. It's ordinary in accordance with the laws of nature and the eternal order of things. Uh, since it is eternal and normal, none of the dignitaries dares to bother his most exalted highness with the news that in such and such a region a given person has died of hunger. Of course, his benevolent highness visits the provinces himself, but it is not his custom to go to the poor regions where there is hunger and, uh, yes, anyway, how much can one see during official visit? Uh? Could we, ask the correspondent, go north? Uh, no, you can't. The roads are full of uh, bandits. Once again, they weren't far from the truth, because increased incidents of armed disloyalty near highways all over the empire had been much reported of late. And so, the ministers took them on an excursion around the capital, showing them factories and praising development. But with that gang, forget it. They don't want development. They demand hunger, and that's all there is to it. Well, you won't get hunger. How can there be hunger if there is development? So a scandal broke out. You can no longer say there is no hunger. And once more, the correspondents attack. They wave their photographs and ask, what has the government done about hunger? His Most Supreme Majesty has attached the utmost importance to the matter. But, but specifically what? His Majesty will announce in the fullness of time his intended royal decisions, assignments, and directions. Because it is not fitting for ministers to do so. So the correspondence flew away without seeing hunger close up and this whole affair conducted so smoothly and in a dignified manner the minister considered a success the press code a victory uh, which was fine but we feared that if the minister should disappear tomorrow there would be nothing but sorrow and that was exactly what happened later when the rebels put him up against the wall. Great discontent, even condemnation and indignation reigned in the palace because of the disloyalty of European governments which allowed Mr. Dimbleby and his ilk to raise such a din on the subject of starvation. Why our most sovereign highness attached the greatest importance to hunger. And so, we eagerly entered on the new road and asked the foreign benefactors for help. Well, not much time had passed before good news came. Airplanes loaded with wheat landed. Ships full of sugar and flour sailed in. Physicians and missionaries came. People from philanthropic organizations, students from foreign colleges, and also foreign correspondents disguised as male nurses. The whole crowd marched north to the provinces of Tigre and Wallow, and also east to Ogaden, where they say whole tribes had perished of hunger. You see, the trivial event that set things off was a fashion show at the university organized by the American Peace Corps even though all meetings and gatherings were forbidden but uh, his distinguished majesty couldn't forbid the Americans a show now could he oh, no, no, no. and so the students took advantage of this cheerful and carefree event to gather in an enormous crowd and set off for the palace from that moment on they never again let themselves be driven back to their homes they held meetings, they stormed implacably and vehemently. They did not yield again. For then, there existed only the 20th century, or perhaps even this 21st century everyone is waiting for, in which blessed justice will reign. Nothing else suited them anymore. Everything else irritated them. They did not see what they wanted to see, and so apparently they decided to arrange the world so they would be able to look at it with contentment. Ah, well. Young people. Very young people. The last year. Yes. But who then could have foreseen that 1974 would have been our last year? Yes. Well, one did feel a sort of vagueness, a melancholy, chaotic ineptness, a sudden negativity, a heaviness in the air, a nervousness and tension, a flabbiness, now dawning, now growing dark. But how did we go so quickly straight into the abyss? 
In January 1974, General Belete Abebe stopped over in the Gode barracks on his way to an inspection in Ogeden. The next day, an incredible report arrived at the palace. The general has been arrested by the soldiers who are forcing him to eat what they eat. Food so obviously rotten that some fear that the general will fall ill and die. On top of all this, like a bolt from the blue, comes the news that the second division had rebelled in Eritrea. They occupy Asmara, arrest the general, lock up the provincial governor, and make a godless proclamation on the radio. They demand justice, pay rises, and humane funerals. The problem of burial had existed for some time. That is to say, to avoid excessive war expenses, only officers had a right to a funeral. The bodies of common soldiers were left to the vultures and hyenas. Such inequality now caused the rebellion, because the following day, the Navy rebels, and the avalanche rolls on, because that very day, the Air Force mutinies. Airplanes buzz the city, and according to Roma, drop bombs. The next day, our biggest and most important division, the 4th, rebels and immediately surrounds the capital. They demand justice and pay rises, and demand that the ministers and governors be brought to court because the soldiers say they corrupted themselves in an ugly way and should stand in the pillory of public opinion. Three factions appear in the palace. The first, the jailers, a fierce and inflexible coterie who demand restoration of order and insist on arrest in the malcontents. A second faction coalesces, the talkers, a coterie of liberals, weak people, philosophizers, who think that one should invite the rebels to come sit around the table and talk. Finally, the third faction is made up of the floaters. This, I would say, is the most numerous group in the palace. They don't think at all and hope that, like corks in water, they will float on the waves of circumstance. And so, in those days, His Majesty rose from his bed with ever-increasing difficulty. Night after night he slept badly or not at all, and so he would not off during the day. He said nothing to us. Not even during meals which he ate surrounded by his family. And so, my friends, in the middle of these suddenly unleashed intrigues that plunged a whole court into such bitter fighting that no one thought about what was going on in the Empire, quite unexpectedly and surprisingly, the army enters the town at night and arrests all ministers of the old government. They even lock up 200 generals and high-ranking officers distinguished in their unfaltering loyalty to the Emperor. Well, no one has had time to recover from the blow when news comes that the conspirators have arrested the chief of General Staff. Well, you can imagine, my friends, that in the palace there was an atmosphere of terror, fear, confusion, and depression. The jailers are pressing the emperor to do something, to order the rescue of those who have been in prison to drive away the students and hang the conspirators. But his benevolent majesty just hears out all this advice, not his assent gives comfort. Suddenly, His Majesty summons his counselors, reprimands them for neglect and development, and after giving them a scolding, announces that we are going to construct dams on the Nile. But how can we erect dams, the confused advisors grumble, when the provinces are starving, the nation is restless, the talkers are whispering about straightening out the empire, and the officers are conspiring and rounding up the notables. Immediately, audacious rumours are heard in the corridors, saying that it would be better to help the starving and forget about the dams. To this, the finance minister replies that if the dams are built, it will be possible to let water into the fields, and such an abundant harvest will result that there'll be no more death from starvation. Yes, but how long will it take to build the dams? In the meantime, the nation will die of hunger. The nation isn't going to die. It hasn't died yet. It isn't going to die now. And if we don't build the dams, how are we going to catch up and so pass? But against whom are we supposed to be racing anyway? What do you mean, whom? Egypt, of course. But Egypt, sir, is wealthier than we are. And even Egypt cannot build dams out of their own pocket. Where are we supposed to find the funds for these damn dams? Here, the minister really lost his temper with the Dalton and began lecturing them, telling them how important it is to sacrifice oneself for development. Besides, His Majesty has ordered, has he not, that we all develop constantly, without resting even a moment, putting our hearts and souls into it. And the Minister of Information immediately announced His Venerable Majesty's decision as a new success. And I remember that in the twinkling of an eye, the 
following slogan appeared on the streets of the capital. As, as soon as, as the work on the dam is done, wealth will accrue to everyone. Let the slanderers spew their lies and shams. They will suffer in hell for opposing our dams. The whole world stood on its head. Strange signs appeared in the sky. The moon and Jupiter stopping in the seventh and twelve houses, instead of turning towards the direction of the triangle, began ominously to form the figure of a square. The Indians who explained their signs at court now fled the palace, probably because they were afraid to disturb his venerable majesty with a bad omen. The remaining jailers too pressed his noble majesty and even begged him on their knees to stop the conspirators, to put them behind bars. But they were completely dumbfounded, however, completely unable to understand when they saw that his most singular majesty now wore his military uniform all the time, medals jingling, and carried his marshal's baton as if to show that he still commanded his army, still stood at its head, still gave the orders. It was rain in that day, a chilly rain. A mist floated in the air as his majesty stepped out onto the balcony to make a speech. Next to him stood only a handful of soaked, depressed dignitaries. The rest were in prison or had fled the capital. There was no crowd, only palace servants and some soldiers from the Imperial Guard standing at the edge of an empty courtyard. His august majesty expressed his compassion for the starving provinces and said he would not neglect any chance to keep the empire developing fruitfully. He thanked the army for its loyalty, praised his subjects, encouraged them and wished them good luck. But he spoke so quietly that through the steady rain one could hardly make out individual words. And know, my friend, that I will take this memory to the grave with me because I can still hear how his majesty's voice breaks and I can see how tears stream down his venerable face. And then, yes, then, for the first time I thought to myself everything was really coming to an end, that on this rainy day all life is seeping away. We are covered in cold, clinging fog and the moon and Jupiter have stopped in the seventh and twelfth houses to form a square. Amid all the depression with the sense of being crushed and pushed against the wall, there suddenly arrived the Swedish physicians, whom his most exceptional majesty had summoned long ago to lead calisthenics at court. It was the desire of his majesty and the crown council just then that all the palace people should take very good care of their health take full advantage of the blessings of nature, rest as much as necessary in comfort and affluence, and breathe good and preferably foreign air. And so it was, my friends, that we, the last remaining handful of people left in the palace, had to fall in for morning calisthenics and force the greatest treasure of the empire into supple fitness by moving our arms and legs about. But the worst thing about the calisthenics was that when a group of courtiers gathered in a salon to wave their arms and legs about, the conspirators would march in and drive everyone off to jail. Now, to prevent the rebels from capturing everyone at once, the Grand Chamberlain pulled off a cunning trick by ordering that the calisthenics be done in small groups. So if some fell into the trap, others would be saved. And the one, and the two, and the three, and the four, and the five. And the one, and the two, and the three, and the four, and the five. One, and the two, and the three, and the four, and the five. And so came the month of August. The last weeks of power for our august ruler. But do I really make myself clear using the word power about these last days of decline. It's so very difficult to establish where the borderline runs between true power that subdues everything, power that creates the world or destroys it, where the borderline is between living power, great, even terrifying, and the appearance of power. 
the empty pantomime of ruling, of being one's own dummy, only playing their role, not seeing the world, not hearing it, merely looking into oneself. And it is still more difficult to say when omnipotence becomes powerlessness, good fortune, adversity, luster, tarnish. See, that was something that no one in the palace could sense, since all gazes were so fixed that in powerlessness they saw omnipotence, in adversity, good fortune, in tarnish, luster. And even if someone had a different perception, how could he, without risking his head, fall to the ground at our monarch's feet and say, Your Majesty, you are already powerless, surrounded by adversity, becoming tarnished. The problem in the palace was that we had no access to the truth. The palace had become the last refuge for dignitaries and notables who came from all over the empire, hoping to be safer at his majesty's side, and hoping that the emperor would save them through his entreaties to the arrogant officers. Without respect for honors and titles, dignitaries and ministers of all ranks, levels and distinctions slept side by side on the carpets, sofas and armchairs, covering themselves with curtains and drapes, over which they got into constant quarrels, because some didn't want the curtains taken down for fear that the rebellious air force would bomb the palace if it was not kept blocked out. The others maintained that they could not fall asleep without covers, so they selfishly tore down the curtains to cover themselves. All these squabbles and jibes were meaningless, however, because the officers soon reconciled them by taking them all off to jail, where those contentious dignitaries could not count on any covers. Life inside the palace seemed strange, as if existing only of itself and for itself. When I went into the town as an official of the palace post office, I would see normal life. Cars driving through the streets, children playing, people selling and buying, old men sitting, talking away. And every day I would pass from one existence to another, no longer knowing which one was real, and feeling that it was sufficient for me to go into the city, to mingle with the crowds, for the whole palace to vanish from memory. It would disappear as if it didn't exist, to the point of making me anxious that when I came back, I wouldn't find it there. He spent the last days alone in the palace with only his old valet de chambre for company. Apparently, the group in favor of closing the palace and dethroning the emperor had gained the upper hand in the dark. None of the names of the officers was known, none was announced. They acted in total secrecy until the end. Now, they say that this group was headed by a young major named Mengistu Haile Mariam. There were other officers too, but they were all dead. Now I remember when this Mariam came to the palace as a captain. His mother was a servant in the court, so I cannot tell who made it possible for him to graduate from the officer's school. Anyway, he was slight, slender, always tense but in control of himself. At least that was the impression he gave. And he knew the structure of the court. He knew who was who and whom to arrest and when in order to prevent the parish from functioning, to make it lose its power and strength, and change it into a useless simulacrum that today stands abandoned and deteriorating. The crucial decisions of its military committee must have been taken sometime around the 1st of August. The military committee, that is, the Dirk, was composed of 120 delegates, elected at meetings in divisions and garrisons. They had a list of 500 dignitaries and courtiers, whom they gradually arrested, creating a sinking emptiness around the emperor, until finally he was left alone in the palace. And so, in those days, 
only the officers intruded. First, they would come to me, asking to be announced to his unparalleled majesty. Then, they would enter the office, where his highness would seat them in comfortable armchairs. Then, they would read a proclamation demanding that his benevolent majesty give back the money which they claim he has been illegally appropriating for 50 years, depositing in banks around the world and concealing in the palace and the homes of dignitaries and other notables. This, they say, should be returned because it is the property of the people from whose blood and sweat it came. What money are you talking about? His benevolent majesty asks. Everything went for development, for catching up and surpassing. And the development was proclaimed a success, was it not? We had no money for ourselves. Some development, cry the officers. And they get up from the armchairs, lift the great Persian carpets off the floor. And there, under the carpet, a rows of dollar bills stuck together, one next to the other, so that the floor looked green. In the presence of his august majesty, they order the sergeants to count the money, write down the amounts, and carry it away to be nationalized. They leave soon afterwards. Then his majesty calls me into his office and orders me to hide among his books the money he used to keep in his desk. Since his majesty, as the designated descendant of Solomon, had a great collection of holy scriptures translated into many languages, that is where we stashed away the money. But those officers, clever sharks they were, the next day they came, read their proclamation, and demanded the return of the money, which they say they need to buy flour for the starving. His Majesty, sitting at his desk, shows them the empty drawers, at which the officers spring from their chairs, grab the Bibles from the bookcases, and shake all the dollars out. Whereupon, the sergeants count them, write down the figures, and take them away to be nationalized. All this is nothing, say the officers. The rest of the money should be returned, especially the amounts in the Swiss and British banks, in His Majesty's private account, estimated at half a billion dollars. Persuade his majesty to sign the appropriate checks. And thus they claim the money would be returned to the nation. Where am I to come up with all this money from? His benevolent majesty asks. All I have is a few pennies for the care of my ailing son in a Swiss hospital. Pretty pennies there are too, say the officers. And they read aloud a letter from the Swiss embassy which says that His Majesty has on account in banks there the sum of one hundred million dollars. <laughs> they go on quarreling until finally His Majesty falls into meditation, closes his eyes and stops breathing. The officers withdraw, promising to return Silence fell on the palace, but it was a bad silence in which one could hear the cries from the streets. Demonstrators marched through the town, and all sorts of rabble loitered around, cursing the emperor, calling him thief, and wanting to string him up from a tree. Crook, give us back our money. Hang the emperor, hang the emperor. So I would close all the windows to the palace to prevent those indecent and slanderous cries from reaching his venerable majesty's ears, from stirring his blood. Then, I would quickly lead my lord to the chapel, which is in the most secluded place. And in order to muffle that blasphemous roar, I would read aloud to him the words of our prophets. Also, take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest I hear thy servant curse thee. They are vanity in the work of errors in the time of the visitation, they shall perish. Remember, O Lord, what is come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach. The joy of our heart is ceased, our dance is turned into mourning. The crown is fallen from our head. For this our heart is faint, for these things our eyes are dim. How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones of this sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. 
They that were brought up in scarlet embraced dunghills. Thou hast seen all their vengeance and all their imaginations against me. Thou hast heard their reproach, O Lord, the lips of those that rose up against me. I am their music. They have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me. I am their music. They have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast the stone upon me. And as his majesty listened, he would doze off. There I would leave him and proceed to my lodgings to hear what was being said on the radio. In those days, the radio was the only link between the empire and the palace. At the end of August, the military proclaimed the nationalization of all the emperor's palaces. There were 15 of them. His private enterprises met the same fate. Among them, the St. George's Brewery, the Addis Ababa Bus Company, the Mineral Water Factory in Hamburg. The officers came to the palace and announced that in the evening, the television would show a program that the emperor should watch. His Imperial Highness willingly agreed to fulfill this request. He sat down in his armchair and watched the program. It was Ethiopia, the Unknown Famine, by Jonathan Dimbleby. At daybreak, three officers dressed in combat uniform made their way to the chamber where the Emperor had been since dawn. After a preliminary bow, one of the officers read out the act of dethronement. His Imperial Highness heard out the officer's words and expressed his thanks to everyone and added that if the revolution is good for the people, then he too supports the revolution and would not oppose the dethronement. In that case, said the officer, his Imperial Highness will please follow us. In the driveway stood a green Volkswagen. An officer opened the door, held the front seat so that the Emperor could get into the back. I'm supposed to go like this. The Volkswagen set off, preceded by a jeep full of armed soldiers towards the 4th Division barracks. It wasn't 7 o'clock yet. They were driving through empty streets. With a gesture of his hand, His Imperial Highness greeted those few people they passed along the way. Everybody left the palace.